Before we start our lesson this morning, it's been brought to my attention that there's a young lady at the Penirol Church of Christ who is in her 50s, and Josh, you correct me if I'm wrong, she's in her 50s and she is having some lung issues. She needs to have a lung replacement. Uh, she is not doing well. I'd like to take a time and let's have a special prayer. Her name is Roxanne. Josh, if you would, would you lead that prayer for us, please? Dear Lord, we know in this life we often take many things for granted, and especially our health. And Lord, we want to lift up Roxanne and her family as she's been battling her lung disease for some time now. And we know that she's nearing the final time unless the lung transplant is made available. And Lord, we just can't fathom what the family is going through. And we lift them up to you and know that you are the only one who can provide that true comfort. And if they can find you in the guidance, then you, know, you will be there with them during this difficult time. And Lord, we pray if the, a transplant does open up, that it is a match, Lord, and that you know, everything will go well. And if it be in your will, that she will have many more years left on this earth. God, we are so thankful for the many blessings that you bestow on us. And we know that you have the power to do all things, Lord. And God, we beseech you in this hour to... Take care of this family and guide them through this difficult time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I ask you as you go to your Heavenly Father in prayers throughout the week, please remember Roxanne and her family uh, in your prayers, and we hope best for her and her family. I know it might not seem possible, but I got to thinking about the time when I was a child. I used to go to Philadelphia, Mississippi. One week out of every year, and it was an exciting week for me. My uncle Homer was a doctor in Philadelphia, Mississippi, and I had my cousins there. And in Philadelphia, when the fairgrounds there, people owned homes, and they stay at the fairgrounds all week long. And to a kid, that's a great place to be, I can tell you. I loved every single minute of it. And we would stay out there and we got to run rampant and free and do all kinds of things. But one thing I remember in particular, and it may seem silly to you, but one of our favorite places for me and my cousins to go was to go to that display of those weird mirrors. The mirrors that you'd stand in front of, and some of them would make you look tall, some of them make you look skinny, some of them make you look fat. Some of them could make your face look weird, and some of them you looked in and you looked like you'd been at a, a group of headhunters and they had shrunk in your head. But all kinds of things. These mirrors were great at distorting things. And I can tell you that it made us laugh. We laughed a lot even when I started thinking about it the other evening, I was laughing, thinking about my cousins, John and Joe Nick and those as we would laugh and point at each other. And that may seem silly to you, but, and I'm sure that you know the mirrors that I'm talking about. Some of these mirrors are very interesting. But what about the thought of seeing a distorted image of myself in those mirrors? It can still make me just laugh and laugh and laugh. But unfortunately, seeing a distorted image of our faith is not nearly as funny. Not anywhere as funny as those mirrors were. As we continue our study of Hebrews this morning, we come to the final chapter. And we're nearing the completion of our study of this great book. We have received encouragement. We've received correction and instructions from the writer. Has used the light of scriptures to show us Jesus. And show us how we are to live like Christ. He has used the sharp double-edged sword of God's word. To show us our weaknesses, our strengths, our commitments lack of commitment. He has done this in an effort to keep us focused on what we're called to do and to keep us focused on what we have been delivered from. 
and through his writing, he has given us a mirror, a true mirror, an undistorted mirror, one that shows us and our faith for what it really is. Unfortunately, you know, we often prefer the mirror of our own minds, like those godly mirrors at the fair or those distorted goofy mirrors at the fair that distort our views. Let's read, if you would, turn in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 13. And beginning in verse 1, I'm going to read through verse 1 to verse 6. Reading for from the uh, it says, Keep on loving each other as brothers and sisters. Don't forget to show hospitality to strangers, for some who have done this have entertained angels without realizing it. Remember those in prison as if you were there yourself. Remember also those being mistreated as if you felt their pain in your own bodies. Give honor to marriage and remain faithful to one another in marriage. God will surely judge people who are immoral and those who commit adultery. Don't love money, be satisfied with what you have. For God has said, I will never fail you. I will never abandon you. So we can say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. So I will have no fear. What can mere people do to me? In this passage, we see in this scripture, a mirror image of what we should really be. Let's look first at what we should be. This is how we should see ourselves if we're truly, truly surrendered to Christ. Look at verse 1. He says there, keep on loving each other as brothers and sisters. We've discussed love many times on many occasions in many sermons. The religious leaders asked Jesus in the book of Matthew, said, what is the greatest commandment was? And he said, love God with all your heart, your mind, and your soul, and love your neighbor as yourself. Here our writer really confirms this teaching and continues it. As we look in the mirror of scripture, do we see ourselves? Continuing to love others as Jesus commanded? Are we treating all of them with love, with respect? I want to say that every time I look in the mirror, that is what I see. But you know, that would be a distorted image from my mind. Why? Because I don't always do that. Sometimes I get drunk, grumpy. Sometimes I get busy. Sometimes I get distracted. And sometimes I plain am just self-centered. And all of these are feeble excuses. The bad part is I often look into the scripture mirror and like the older brother in the parable of the prodigal son, I claim I've done that. I've always done that. I've been the best that could have, but I am looking with skewed eyes because in reality, I am less than perfect. In reality, I'm a sinner. I'm picking on myself, but I urge you to look into your own mirrors. Look into your own mirrors. What do you see? Do you love others as brothers and sisters? Or is the reflection distorted? Loving others is a true sign of salvation. Jesus himself said, is there is no love in us. We are not God's children. In order to change the image in those funny mirrors, sometimes you have to move. Sometimes if you really want to change, you need to go to another mirror one that actually shows the truth. I urge you to look at your life through God's mirror, his holy word. The next image our writer shows us comes from verse two. Don't forget to show hospitality to strangers. For some who have done this have entertained angels without realizing it. You know, we tend to think of hospitality as inviting someone over for supper. 
But the verse is really continues the theme of loving others. Showing hospitality to strangers, you know, this includes at church, at home, at work, and we go about our lives. What this means is showing kindness, compassion, concern, speaking love into someone's life, lending a helping hand when possible, an encouraging word, or a prayer when needed. Remember the story of the Good Samaritan, how he helped someone, tended to them with compassion, with mercy, with love. This is how we are to be. It might mean giving things like food, clothing, money to someone in need. You never know what that stranger might be. You all remember the TV show, Hee Haw? Do you remember Grandpa Jones? He told a story in a song. And I think it's interesting because Reba McIntyre wrote the song for him. But it really demonstrates, I think, what the Lord is talking about. That song was called The Christmas Ghost, Christmas Guest. And I'd like to take just a moment and read the lyrics from that song. Some of you may know them. It happened one day during December's end when two neighbors called on an old friend and they found his shop so meager and lean, made gay with thousands of bows of green. And Conrad was sitting with face shining when he suddenly stopped as he stitched a twine and he said, old friends, it's dawn today and the cock was crowing the night away. The Lord appeared in a dream to me and said, I'm coming your guest to be. So I've been busy with feet, feet of steam, stern, st stewing my shop with branches of fern. The table is spread and the kettle is shine and over the rafters, the holly is twined. Now I'll wait for my Lord to appear and listen closely so I will hear his steps as he nears my humble place. And I'll open the door and look on his face. So his friends went home and left Conrad alone, for this was the happiest day he had known. For long since his family had passed away, and Conrad had spent many a sad Christmas day. But he knew with the Lord as his Christmas guest, this Christmas would be the dearest and best. So he listened with only joy in his heart and with every sound he would rise with a start and look for the Lord to be at his door. Like the vision he had heard a few hours before. So he ran to the window after hearing a sound, but all he could see on the snow covered ground was a shabby beggar whose shoes were torn and all of the clothes were ragged and worn. But Conrad was touched and he went to the door and he said, you know, your feet must be frozen and sore. I have some shoes in my shop for you and a coat that will keep you warmer too. So with grateful heart, the man went away. But Conrad noticed the time of day and wondered what made the Lord so late and how much longer he'd have to wait. When he heard a knock and ran to the door, but it was only a stranger once more. A bent old lady with a shawl of black with a bundle of kindling piled on her back. She asked for only a place to rest, but that was reserved for Conrad's great guest. But her voice seemed to plead, don't send me away. Let me rest for a while on Christmas day. So Conrad brewed her a steaming cup and told her to sit at the table and sup. But after she left, she was filled with dismay for he for he saw that the hours were slipping away and the Lord hadn't come as he said he would. Then Conrad felt sure he had misunderstood. When out of the stillness, he heard a cry, please help me and tell me where am I? So again, he opened his friendly door and stood disappointed as twice before. It was only a child that wandered away and was lost from her family on Christmas day. And Conrad's heart was heavy and sad, but he knew he should make the little girl glad. 
So he called her in and he wiped her tears, quieted all her childish fears. Then he led her back to her home once more, but as he ended, as he entered his own darkened door, he knew the Lord was not coming today. Well, the hours of Christmas had passed away, so he went to his room and he knelt down to pray. And he said, Dear Lord, why did you delay? What kept you from coming to call on me? For I wanted so much your, your face to see when soft in the silence a voice he heard. Lift up your head, for I kept my word. Three times my shadow crossed your floor, and three times I came to your lovely door. I was a beggar with bruised and cold feet. I was the woman you gave something to eat. I was a child on the homeless street. Three times I knocked and three times I came in, and each time I found the warmth of a friend. Of all the gifts, love is the best, and I was honored to be your Christmas guest. The man in this story shows kindness to strangers, and in doing so, he entertained Jesus three times. When we look in the mirror of scripture of ourselves, is this what we see? Are we showing kindness and hospitality to strangers? Or is the image distorted? Next is verse 3. He says that we are to remember those who are suffering. Remember those in prison if you were there yourself. Remember also those being mistreated as if you felt their pain in your own bodies. You know, I don't know about you, but when I think of those in prison, I have mixed emotions. Let me be honest. Some people are in prison because they truly belong there. And in my heart, in my mind, I'm glad that they're there. As they are no longer a threat to society, they have done something wrong and they are getting what they deserve in the eyes of the law and society. But I try to use this knowledge to excuse or justify my lack of concern. But in the mirror of scripture, there is no excuse for my not praying for them, no excuse for me not sharing the word of God with them. So maybe the word will change them by changing their hearts. Also, we must remember that there are many types of prisons. Some are still prisoners to their sins, others prisoners to their own bodies due to health issues. So our writer is telling us that when we look into the mirror of scripture, we should see compassion for those who are suffering, those in prison justly or unjustly, that we should show compassion and concern for those who are suffering whatever the reason. And the question is, do we? The next image he shows us is found in verse four. Give honor to marriage and remain faithful to the one another in marriage. God will surely judge people who are immoral and those who commit adultery. Give honor to marriage and be faithful to each other. Let's look at honor first. Are we faithful? to our spouses by honoring them. You know, if you take the time to look in a dictionary, and I know we don't do that anymore, we just Google everything. But if you'll take the time to really look in a dictionary, the word honor has many meanings. All of them should apply to our spouses. The first that is listed there is high respect or esteem. Are you treating your spouse with high respect and esteem. What does the mirror show? The next is privilege. Do you consider it a privilege to be with this person who God has placed into your life? Do they see that you feel that way? The next definition is regard with deep respect. This means to admire, to appreciate, value, cherish, adore. Do you see that in the mirror? The next is, is fulfill an obligation or keep an agreement. Are you keeping your promises, your covenant agreement? Does the mirror show this? In real simple terms, are you men, are you women? 
treating your spouse with kindness, with humility? Do your words and actions say, I love you? Can we truly say we place their wants and their needs, desires ahead of our own? Our writer in verse 4 goes on into the topic of adultery and immorality. The topic of sexual immorality and adultery seems to come up quite a lot in our society these days. It should come up more often in churches. Why? Because the topic comes up a lot in Scripture, and I believe if the truth was taught and learned, the world would be a much better place. God is serious about his commandments. When he says stay away from sexual immorality, he means it. One more that we need to address this morning, and this one may affect more of us than any of the others. The image can actually be looked at with a distorted view by all around us. Let's look at verse 5 and the very first part of it. Don't love money. Be satisfied with what you have. In this dog-eat-world society, and as a result, many well-meaning Christians place way too much value on money and possessions. This world sees a large bank account, a big beautiful house as signs of success. As a result of that, many focus too much on the things that can fade. Remember last week's sermon? We focus too much, place too much value on places too much faith in shakable things such as money and possessions. Money in and itself is not evil. We should work hard to get ahead, but the love of money actually changes the monetary to deity in our minds and in the minds of our hearts. The love of money and things elevates those things into positions that they should not hold. God says that we're not to worship idols. Most of us would never, ever consider to bow down to a statue of an image of a make-believe God. But with money, we can quickly bow down. How, you may ask, choosing money over God, working instead of going to church by choice, choosing money over God in terms of tithing, our money is a gift from God, and when we are stingy with it, it becomes a God itself. Choosing money over God in terms of fellowship. I could go on on this for days about how we place money in a place that it does not deserve. But you know the image in the mirror is not often what I want to see. Sometimes the image I see is distorted. Sometimes I fail to see my own faults, thinking I'm somewhat better than I am. Sometimes I see too many faults, thinking that I'm worse than I am. So we must learn to see the real image. In order to do this, first we must look at the right mirror. Look at the right mirror. God's word is the true mirror, brethren, and we should be using to view our lives. It shows us right from wrong. It gives us a clear picture of our weaknesses, but it also gives a clear picture of our strengths. We need to look at this with the right mind, by prayer, by study, being humble, repentant, with moldable hearts. We need to look into the mirror with the right attitude. Paul says in Romans chapter 12, verse 3, be honest in your evaluation of yourself, measuring yourself by the faith God has given us. He says not to think we are something that we are not. He also means not, don't think too little of yourself. Here's what I need you to understand. God loves us. God loves you. You were created in his image. Though Jesus Christ and his sacrifice and your confession of his name and being baptized for the remission of sins, he has changed your image. He has made you into a new 
creature. He has forgiven you and redeemed you. And now it's time to look at ourselves in the right light and become that image that is shown in the mirror of God's word in order to see ourselves in the proper image. We should say there is a God and he created me and he loves me and he gave me Jesus to make me perfect in spite of my imperfections. Let me close with verse 6 from our passage today. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 6. I will never fail you. I will never abandon you. So we can say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. So I will have no fear. What can mere people do to me? I will never fail you. I will never abandon you. So we can say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. So I will have no fear. What can mere people do to me? Brethren, we need to be about studying God's word. If we truly love him, we would want to hear his messages, to read the many letters that he's provided for us, to give us guidance, to give us an abundant life. We should be about prayer, making time each and every day to pray, to give our concerns to him, but to thank him for the lives that we have and the wonderful blessings that he bestows upon us. We need to focus our lives on Christ. If you haven't ever named his name, today would be a great day to do that. Say that I believe that he's son of the living God to be buried in baptism for the remission of sins. Today would be a wonderful day to do that. But if you are here, think about what you've turned away from if you've turned away from him. That you're involved in the world, think about what you've lost. Think about that he gave his life on the cross for you and for me. And yes, he asked, asked us to follow his commands. But he is merciful and he gives grace to us. And all we have to do is to ask him for his forgiveness and strive hard to live the Christian life. If you're here this morning and have need of the invitation, won't you come while together we stand and sing. Sweet be Lord, have we heard thee call?